good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, virtual excursion. Um, it's an excursion to a spectacular section of the Fife Coast. Um, I've used the Kinghorn Kirkcaldy Geological Trail leaflet as a guide for this talk, which uh, hopefully you've all downloaded or printed off. Um, there are a number of fascinating geological features displayed in the leaflet, but there is also a lot more of interest to be seen. Oh, happened. Oh. Can't seem to find my next slide. I expect they'll be there somewhere. Um, seems to have frozen. Oh, damn. Can you exit share screen and try again? Mm, I'm trying to. All right, yeah. Um, okay, I'll try that again. Oh, no. On the beginning. Right. Ah, yeah, right, we're in business. So these are the, in addition to the leaflet, these are the uh, resources that I use to put this talk together. Um, this uh, outdoor teacher's guide is very useful. Uh, that's available to download online as well. The, um, the old Fife and Dangus Geology by McGregor has an excursion in here. And um, Francis in the old 1960 Edinburgh geology. I also use the um, geology of Central and Western Fife, a memoir by Archibald Geeky, um, from published in 1900. Uh, again, very useful. I also used the uh, section on the Kinghorn Volcanic Formation in uh, Heather Rockcliffe's books, Heather Rockcliffe's PhD thesis um, in Glasgow, uh, which was completed in December 2015. So I've pinched a couple of uh, pictures and things from her thesis. I hope she doesn't mind. So, Topographical map, here we are, Kinghorns down here, it's the 1 to 25,000 map. Uh, Kirkcaldy's up here, Seafield, this is where we'll meet tomorrow. This building here is the Morrison supermarket, the car park is in here. Okay, and the old uh, Seafield colliery is in this area. So this is this is the first thing I pinched from um, Heather Rockcliffe. It's a map showing the uh, Carboniferous basins during the Dinantian epoch, and we are interested in the Fife Midlothian basin here. And this is the uh, Burnt Island anticline, and we'll be looking at an area on the east side of. This is the um, geological map of the area. Again, down here is King Horn. This is the Burnt Island anticline. We'll be looking at the first Abdon limestone here. Um, the second Abdon limestone, Seafield Tower. And the Canini limestones fall within the lower limestone formation. Then a few intrusions and then into the limestone coal formation. Missed something, yeah. Right. Ah, that's what I missed. Um, this is just to show the um stratigraphy, the um Kinghorn Volcanic Formation occurs within the Sandy Craig Formation. Um, so we'll be looking at Sandy Craig and Pathhead Formations within the Strathclyde Group. 
and the lower limestone formation and the limestone coal formation within the Clack Manning group. So we'll be going from the Visayan into the Namurian. Right, first locality. For convenience, I decided to start here at locality two on the leaflet, as many of the features seen here are also seen, or many of the features seen at locality one are also present here. Also, from Petticur to location one is another excursion in its own right, which I hope to find someone to do for us sometime in the future. Um, so the lavas here are basaltic with massive cores, vesicular tops and bases. Columnar jointings develop locally where lava is bonded, but pillows are commonly developed where lava has come into contact with water or saturated sediments, forming hyaloclastite, pillow breccia, and peperites at the lava sedimentary interface. So this picture here, you see lots of rounded shapes. These are all pillows, as are these over here and those here. Um, this is Inch Keys, just to locate you. Over here is Edinburgh, Arthur Seat, Salisbury Crags, the Braid Hills, and in the background, the Pentland Hills. This is King Horn, King Horn Bay, and just the edge of the King Horn Caravan, Caravan Park. So this is uh, locality two on the leaflet. It is the, uh, the bay that contains pillow lavas here, then tubes and tufaceous sediments and shells here. There is a fault in here, oh, maybe I'll show it better on this slide. Um, there is a fault here repeating the section, then throwing to the south, to the left in this picture. So again, we have the lavas and tubes and shells going up into the first Abdon limestone here. Um, these holes here in the, uh, the diggings into the um, shales here are probably people looking for the Abdon bone bed, which is supposed to occur around this level. Um, yeah, this is on the other side. People have been digging in here as well. I um, hastened to add it wasn't me. Um, So the Abdon bone beds contains a number of fish species, fish genera, including Elanichthys, Coelacanthus, Megalichthys, and Rhizodopsis. I assume that they are uh, marine fish, but I'm not sure. Not exactly sure. I can use a bit of focus. Um, within the shells here, there, come on, behave yourself. There are a number of brachiopods uh, impressions on these shells here, which are quite um, friable and are not really collectible. But it does show that there are marine fossils within this. So the um, First Abdon limestone uh, consists of several thick beds of limestone with shaly partings and calcareous lavas on uh, calcareous shales on top, overlain by this thick lava. Um, so the first Abdon limestone is, is fairly fossiliferous. It contains crinoids, corals, and brachiopods usual suspects. Um, to close up of the... Ah, that's better. So this is the lava um, 
overlying the, the calcareous shells, forming these uh, pillow structures, pollen pillow structures. And down here to the right, uh, not too clearly seen on this, but there are flame structures uh, as well that indicate there are examples of loading and soft sediment deformation. Looking at in the fields. So, on to locality three. This is a uh, red weathered unit within a wave cut notch between two lavas in an old sea cliff, indicating sea level change since the last glaciation. Uh, close up, it is a laterite or a bowl or a pallium salt. Um, it shows weathering of the top of the underlying lava, although photomicrographs I'll show in a minute um, show the unit to be dominated by rounded class of reddened volcaniclastic material and class of siltstone and glassy basalt, all within a fine grain matrix. So it's possibly a tool. So again, I pinched this from uh, Heather Rockcliffe's thesis. It's photomicrographs in uh, plain polarized light. This uh, A is uh, showing the unit dominated by volcanic material with fine grain matrix. B is an enlargement of uh, A, showing rounded class with defined nuclei. And C shows this large class of siltstone. And D shows an irregular class of glassy basalt. So the reddening suggests a hiatus in the lava extrusion and prolonged exposure to weathering or erosion, allowing the formation of these sedimentary units before the next eruption of lava. The overlying lava is coarsely crystalline basalt, slaggy vesicular tolerated texture. Moving on to uh, locality four. We have, this is the uh, top of the uh, upper lava that we saw at the last locality. The lava is pillowed and amygdaloid on here with green tuff in filling the uh, joint. Now, this is a video that I took of this locality. So to be able to show it, I need to come out of the uh, slideshow. And then if you bear with me for just 16 seconds, talk amongst yourself for 16 seconds. I think uh, we can all wait for 50 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's always there. Right, there we go. So that was the, um, oh, damn, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't have touched anything. That was the lime kiln there on the left with the uh, pillow lavas, uh, the overlying green tuff and red tuff in the, uh, cliff face there. The strata there are dipping towards the camera, towards the sea. And they look as if they're um, horizontal, but they're not. They're dipping about 20 degrees towards us here. The, um, I'm scared to touch anything, but the, um, the pale, thin pale unit there is the, um, the sea earth. And the buildings you can see at the top right uh, are called Linton Court and according to Geeky that these buildings were um, the Kirkcaldy Poor House. So I'll go back into the um, slideshow. Carry on. 
Okay, so <clears throat> on top of the uh, lavas there, there's about six meters of uh, green turf with a lacquer turf near the top. And this gives way to red turf, which has been oxidized during tropical weathering, and then gone back into reducing conditions and on green turfs again. And at the top of the green turfs is the seat earth, which is this pale unit here. There's a hammer and a walking pole for scale that. The um, seat earth has been leached of um, soluble iron. Um, there's no coal present at the top of the, the seat earth. It's probably been eroded. So this is a very small exposure of the uh, Lapoli Tuff. It's um, not very well exposed amongst the uh, beach deposits. This is a picture that Heather Rockliffe had taken and a sketch to show the uh, well-defined coated ash pellets um, and this band of densely packed ash aggregate between the layers of fine tuff. Um, she also has done um, photomicrographs, sorry, of this. So picture the ones on the left are in plain polarized light, the ones on the left in cross, the ones on the right, sorry, in cross polars. The um, A is fine grained tuff, and B is enlargement of that, showing subangular quartz, lithics, and volcanic glass. The uh, B and, sorry, C and D are basalt lithic fragments, and P, surrounded by a dotted line here, is a coated pellet. E and F are coated pellet, and G is a relict pumice shard, oh, sorry, G and H are both. Uh, relic pumice shard again indicating explosive volcanism. Okay on the top of the seat earth instead of a coal we have this two to five centimeter thick mudstone with a Niodites crassa bivalves which are freshwater bivalves and this thin unit has been interpreted as a lake deposit. <coughs> Excuse me. So on top of this, um, we have indication of a rising sea level, a transgression that led to deposition of about 2.7 meters of marine shell um, with lingula, followed by a grey limestone. Just to go back, sorry, this is one picture of the limes, the uh, mudstone. This is another one showing again, diodites within here. The difference between these two slides is this one was taken in the winter months, and this one was taken in the summer months. And you can see it's completely covered in seaweed. So I'd never realized this before, but Sea plants, I guess, are just like land plants. Um, they grow in the summer and die back in the winter. So this is the um, second Abdin limestone, which is the equivalent of the Hurlet limestone that marks the start of the lower limestone formation and the onset of fully marine conditions. The limestones and the shales below them contain numerous corals, Colonial and solitary, Siphonodendron and Saprentus, Crinoid, Gigantoproductus, and other brachiopods. So you can see here that the strata dip to the east at around 20 degrees. There is also abundant zoophycus trace fossils on the bedding surfaces. So, on to look at it. five. This is the um, prominent fault scarp bridge here that forms a ridge across the, uh, the beach. 
on the right here, we have the uh, Arlet limestone, well bedded, and on the left, on the left, we have it's probably better seen here. We have the um, lavas. So the down throw in this fault is to the to the south. I always have this trouble with PowerPoints. Um, just as a matter of interest, where this person is walking, um, last year when we did this walk, we had to go to the end of this bay and then walk back again because it's not possible to get around the uh, point uh, unless it's a very low tide. But this year, um, I think the people who conservation volunteers who um, deal with this part of the coastal tribe have exhumed a set of steps that obviously were there but not visible under all the vegetation. So there is now a set of steps you can access or leave the, the bay from. So the next locality is a lateral variation along strike from um, locality four. Here we have the um, the sea turf, the pale sea turf, overlain by the marine shale, and then to the limestone, which is a bit more massive here, less bedded. But what you will notice is that there is no uh, mudstone with niodites here. The um, marine shells rest directly on the um, Again, show that was a sort of early spring picture, and that was a bit summer picture with lots of seaweeds. This is a sort of general to show if I can do it without changing slides. Here is the um, the lime kiln from before. This is where we looked at the lavas and first section in here. This is the uh, little bridge of uh, fault and dam. And the last couple of slides were taken just in here. Uh, just to point out, this is flowering um, blackthorn. This picture was taken in April and the black. Okay, locality seven. Um, this location is listed as optional on the leaflet, so it's not really included. Um, but it is well uh, represented on the teacher's guide. So, sorry. so from the coastal path, you um, follow the wall down towards the, this is on the headland follow the wall down to the end of the headland and follow a small track to the left that comes out across this metal bridge and onto the beach again here. So these are the lavas, the same lavas that we saw back at um, locality four. This is the Arlet limestone again. This will disappear off in, in land here, and this is the last exposure of it. Um, so under the metal bridge here, we have another fall. The, um, there's radiation and reddening here, but not much displacement. We've seen so a relatively, <coughs> relatively minor fault. Um, the lavas here are quite um, vesicular and uh, have a lot of Amingdale to them here. Seems to be quite um, patchy in places. So this, um, go back. Yeah, this is the uh, Teshanite sill that uh, intrudes into the uh, lower limestone formation at this point. So this is the cell. 
um, there is tashinite, which is an alkali dolerite with analcine and sodium rich and magnesium minerals. The um, sill is overlain by cross bedded, quite coarse sandstones and also well bedded sandstones and shells. The um, sill is bifurcates here, which, oh, come on, can be shown by these big sediments at the base. This is one leaf of the sill, and this some more, another leaf, another band of sediments, again baked, overlain by, or intruded by another leaf of the uh, sill. The sill can also be shown to be transgressive through these sediments. Um, and according to McGregor, it's, uh, it shows white trap in places, but uh, I wasn't able to see the uh, white trap alteration in this particular cell. Although, as we'll see later, there's a lot in some of the other cells. So, white trap is an intrusive rock such as basalt or dolerite that has been bleached and altered to pale carbonate and clay minerals by contact with coal or other carbonaceous material. So beyond the um, sill and the sandstone, there is a lot of sandstones and sea terrace that are highly bioturbated, like this seat earth here with, uh, looks like in situ stigmaria. Um, this is heavily bioturbated seat earth, showing, um, I think, probably Scalisa's trace fossils. And um, horizontally, horizontal ones with the planolites or alacinoides. So the um, cetas here are highly bioturbated. Um, oh, there's another good one. This slide is from 2010, where, which I must have been on the trip here that was led by um, Rosalind Garton. This is, uh, some of you may recognize, the field gear in the boots of Tom Kerr, who unfortunately is no longer with us now. But the, going back to the burrowing here, this is what um, uh, Brian Lovell used to call burrow to buggery. And you see what he means. Uh, this is a very interesting trace fossil. It is called Asterosoma. And it seems to only occur within one sandstone bed at this locality. It's really quite impressive. Sorry, I just need to have a <coughs> drink there. My throat's getting a bit dry. So it's possible to continue over the sandstones and sea towers we've just been looking at and reach the uh, Seafield Tower Bay that way, but some people might find it hard going. So the alternative is to return to the metal bridge and back up onto the coastal path and follow it round to this bay. So the limestone in, in this bay consists of three main beds, totaling about four meters in thickness, succeeded by 15 meters of calcareous gray shale with prominent siderite nodules and bands of trinoidal limestone up to a meter thick. These beds are grouped together on the geological map as the sepial tower limestone. So as well as crinoids, these beds contain saponodendrons, apprentice, spirifer and productus, and many other fossils. It's very fossiliferous, but mostly in crinoidal. 
The Mill Hill Marine Band that's mentioned in the leaflet is the local equivalent of the Nielsen shell bed and the Seafield Tower limestone is correlated with the Black Hall limestone. Both these limestones are reddened by oxidation and contain abundant crinoid fragments. Um, those of us who were on the uh, Blairscaith quarry trip last year that was led by Neil Clark um, will remember the, uh, the Black Hall limestone from that. Also, um, Katie Strang's talk on five fossils the other week, uh, she mentioned that uh, the Black Hall limestone is one of our uh, particular areas of interest. And she was talking about finding shark's teeth in this, these, this limestone. But I'm not clear whether she meant the other limestones in general or whether it was specifically related to this limestone. Um, I guess when well, those of us are going tomorrow, we need to look more closely, see if we can find some sharp teeth. So there's Tom again, and uh, this was from 2010. There's um, Ari on and oops, Alison Bramley. And these are the uh, prominent cum-bedded sandstones that overlie the limestone. They're about 15 meters thick, and they represent sandbar migration within the fluvial system. And from the orientation of the forceps, it can be shown that the direction of flow is from the north. Oh yeah, I'm doing okay for time. Um, Locality nine. So this is the next bay after the Seafield Sandstone. It is succeeded by about 60 meters of strata um, of sandstone, shales and limestones. So these limestones are the Canini limestones in four beds, only three of which are named lower, middle and upper. So this slide, this is the lower, this is the middle, and this is the unnamed one, the upper one, it's not visible in the slide. This is the Craigfoot Sill, and this is about the East or West Vows Sill. Um, so these Canini limestones are the local equivalent of the Hosey limestone, and the top Hosey marks the transition from the lower limestone formation to the limestone coal formation. So the lower limestone formation, to go back here, this one is sandy and contains algal masses up to about approximately half a meter across. I haven't actually found these, but again, we'll look for this tomorrow when we have a look. Right. Um, the middle Canini limestone, which is this chap here, um, is prominent yellow dolomitized limestone. Um, this feature is mentioned in the, the guide. It's of these um, little thrust faults. Um, there's one here, and one over here. That occurs in a number of places, two or three places within this unit. And it's rather puzzling because it doesn't seem to affect either the underlying or the overlying unit. But um, I'm going to focus on this for a little bit and show you some features of it. So, sorry, we'll go back to that. So we're going to focus on this area here. So this is the end of uh, the edge of that overthrust. Oh, sorry. Um, just to show that this is not a limestone. This is quartz tolerite, still, but we'll come to that later. Um, 
Right, so this is a thrust over here, the underlying black shells and have been acted as a um, lubricant once the, uh, once the um, rift had occurred, it was able to travel quite freely uh, over the top of the unit. Oops. So again, we see here that <coughs> two layers of the um, lime star, thin black shell band in here. The shells here have been undercut by um, erosion by the sea, and so these blocks are fallen down, obscured things. So here's the uh, second Canary limestone heading off to shoreward to disappear in that. So this um, overriding unit, um, this is the edge of it here. You will note there's a little anticlinal fold here within the overlying shells. So here's a close-up of these overlying shells, and you can see that this feather edge along here is in fact a breccia uh, that only occurs at the edge. Here. So it's, um, I can't really explain it, it's quite an interesting feature, but unexplained at the moment. Also unexplained is this, um, this sort of crush zone. It's about a meter wide. Oh, and this is about east-west. It um, quite, quite clearly cuts through the, the uh, strata, but doesn't displace anything. So sorry, just the, the next slide is just to the bottom of this slide here. Um, I had my glasses on for a change and was able to see these sort of what I assumed were uh, brachiopod spines, but they're not. They are um, quite an unusual feature. So again, tomorrow we'll have a look at that and see what people think. And hopefully someone will have a camera that will be able to take a much closer picture than I was able to take there. Okay, this is a picture of the three limestones again, looking towards the um, Seafield Tower. This is the unnamed uh, Canadian limestone, heading off here towards the north. Um, this is it further along the strike to the north. And this is the top. Canadian limestone. Um, <laughs> excuse me, that seems I've lost my notes. <laughs> anyway, so this is this is the top of the um, the upper surface of the top Canadian limestone. So this is the top of the lower limestone formation, which makes this uh, bedded unit here the uh, first uh, strata within the limestone coal formation. Uh, further along strike, this is still the uh, top Kimini uh, limestone here, and these well bedded sandstones and shells with the um, quartz dolerite sill on top here. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to this little feature here, this little anticlinal fold. Come back to that. Um, it's a close up showing the um, these sandstones and the sill. Uh, right, that's 14 minutes, so I'll run through this quickly. These are, this is the breakwater at Seafield, and um, I want to point, these, this is uh, sill material, well jointed sill here, but this is a large raft of sediments that's mostly been 
eroded out by the sea, but you can still see blocks and bits around the side of baked shale. Um, you can see that the uh, the sill here is quite well jointed and sort of mimics bedding, and it's pervasively uh, white trap altered. Um, so it's quite difficult to work out what it was at first, whether it's actually bedded tuff or sandstones or what, but I think it is the intrusion. Um, there is another view of it, and these are the first field sandstones that occur at the top of it. So these are within the limestone coal formation. This is a view from the uh, south of the breakwater, looking back to the slides I've just shown you, which were taken from the top of the breakwater tower. Um, just while I'm here, I mentioned uh, where these houses are. It was the original the site of, this is now a housing estate, but it was the site of the Seafield Colliery, um, work on which uh, started in 1954. The mine was opened in 1960. But despite a projected life of 150 years, with millions of tons of reserves, it was closed in 1988 after only 28 years, and then the buildings were demolished soon after in 1989. So that's the end of that. So this, um, <clears throat> this shows the quartz dolerite intrusion here. There's a bit of a gap, intrusion here, another gap, and the intrusion carries on down towards the south here. Um, these are sediments of dipping to the northeast in a regular fashion. But you'll see there's a block of sediment here that's dipping the opposite way. Um, as we'll see, whoops, sorry, go back to that. The uh, next slide is just over here and shows a band of about 20, 30 centimeters thick of white trap, altered uh, dolerite, and then adjacent to um, fresh, unaltered basalt dolerite. This is looking back that way. This is a continuation. These, uh, again, this is a raft of sediment uh, enclosed within the dolerite. The raft extends down to here. This is a brick lined culvert for the um, Tyree burn. At first I thought it was a, a mine drainage, drainage added for the old mine, but it's not it just culverts the Tyree burn. So going back south um, along the beach, this is the um, quartz tolerate sill that overlies the um, sediments. This is further to the south showing a large gap, the um, sand gap. Looking back to the uh, truncated edge of that sill, this was the um, little anticlinal structure I referred to earlier. You can see it's so slightly plunges to the north, um, the sediments are all dipping quite naturally, even here, dipping to the east. This is dipping the opposite way, so we have the sand decline and then the carry on dipping to the east again. So this has been mentioned in some of the excursion guides that I've looked at, but no one has explained it, and I'm not going to be any different. Um, this is the uh, middle Canadian limestone again. This is the upper one. These are sediments within the limestone coal group. And this is the intrusion of creek foot sill. This is a close up of the sill. Um, there's a sort of hint of columnar jointing in there. Um, yeah, 
not bother seeing anything more about that. This is another seal. This is the Long Creek seal, which again is a quartz dolerite, I believe. And it's just opposite the car park um, at Seafield. So, just the end. This is a little chap I met on my last visit there last month. He seemed to have got lost, separated from his gang. He was trying to find his way back to the sea, which in fact is only about 10 meters off in that direction. Okay, so um, that's it. I will end it there. And tomorrow, those of us who are going to look at the rocks for real, I'll probably start at Seafield Tower, looking at locality 8, and then we'll look at 9 and 10. That's probably all we'll have time for. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that instructive. Right, thank you very much, Ian. That was fantastic. Um, if you can unmute yourself now, is there any questions? For yeah, Ian? of course. Um, we can... Or you could put questions on the chat and that's yeah. another way of, however you wish. I can't find where I am. <laughs> Any questions? All right, here we go. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Oh, Rona's unmuted herself, so it is working. Right, there I am, but I'm not sure how to unmute myself. You're unmuted already. Yeah. Oh, am I? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. So, any questions? Mike's just turned to, he's unmuted yeah, himself. I was just going to make one comment, and that's about Niodites crassus. It's oh, yeah. A rare, it's a rarity. It is a marine fossil. <laughs> Most Niodites are not marine, but Crassus is. Ah, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's some confusion there, yeah. Because at the um, locality number two, um, the list of fossils that was found in above the... Um, Abdon bone bed, they also listed a uh, Niodaces crassus, and I wondered whether uh, were... it, it, it's definitely marine, right? Yeah, okay. Well, there is there's confusion in the literature, then. Oh, that's easy, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just my confusion. Yeah. No, don't worry about it, <laughs> right? Okay, thanks, Mike. On a similar note, the fish you were talking about at the beginning, uh, non-marine fish or brackish water fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think Rona just wants to confirm that uh, you're meeting at Seafield Car Park at 12 o'clock, correct? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, just Rona wanted to confirm that you're meeting at Seafield Car Park at 12 o'clock. Yes, correct? definitely. Very so, good. Rona, are you on the list? Well, I, I should be. I did. Well, you're book not. But oh, you're... I did book it. I thought I had booked it. Right. Well, you're not on the list, but it doesn't matter. Come along anyway. Okay, thank because you. Someone's, I dropped, someone's I, I, dropped out. I did wonder because uh, I, d I definitely put, thought right. I had booked it. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And um, for everyone who is going, do you make sure you read and absorb the absolutely safety, yes. the safety announcement yes. uh, details concerning COVID, um, especially yeah. at this time? Of course. But as I mentioned to you earlier, Tom, I think in a, a, an email I sent you that you know the trip to Ballantrae showed that you can be perfectly safe out on the shore um, mm -hmm. distance and it doesn't feel difficult at all. We all felt perfectly comfortable being outside. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it's obviously a lower risk outside. So hope nobody comes back ill. <laughs> well, yes. 
famous last words, yeah. Yeah. There's a question from David Longstaff here. Um, and you can unmute yourself if you want to, David. Um, <clears throat> is he still there? Yeah. Unmute yourself. I'll just read it out for him then. It's based, he's asking, uh, oh no, he's unmuted himself. So he was asking um, the unusual trace fossil you showed earlier in the talk after a cycle. Asterosoma. Sorry, soma, yeah. Asterosoma. He was asking what type of trace that is, a resting trace or a feeding trace? Or uh, I think the general consensus is that it's a feeding trace. It's a sort of shrimp-like body lived in the center, a hole in the center. And, and that was, in fact, if you look at it closely, I don't know if you can bring it up. Um, it's sort of made up of layers of, um, layers of sediment. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go online, there are some really spectacular things. You see there, you know, they're little, it's almost like a volcano. It's like a sand volcano, but with an organic um, cause, if you like. I, I believe it's a, a, a feeding trace, a yeah. phodicnia. I believe they're called. Oh, really? Well, that's the group of trace fossils. Ah, ah right. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, I was going to say there are some that come from Kansas and yeah. places in the mid, the Midwest and the states that that are actually um, more resistant than the surrounding rock, and they've been weathered out. Oh, that's extraordinary looking things. Yeah. So it's worth looking online for them. I remember seeing some large thalassinoides burrows doing a similar thing. Ah, uh -huh. right. Uh, yeah. Okay, so if, uh, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, I'll just thank Ian for his time and I hope, wish everybody well tomorrow. Um, yeah, thank you. The, um, the Jopper field trip, the last field trip is cancelled, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, but um, everybody take care and thank you very much Ian once again. Okay, thank you Tom. Right. I shall stop recording. How did we get out of here?